Are you looking for truth from God's Word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. Just like those men did in days of old, because we want that wisdom for ourselves, I pray that we'll pay the price no matter the cost. Now, I know that some of you may not be able to be here every week. I encourage you to listen to it on the air. I encourage you to watch it on YouTube. It's all being filmed. I pray that you'll be able to pick up a copy of these notes because, dads, I want your highest passion and desire right now is not only just to provide food for your family and all that, the protection, but that you now would step up to the plate and be the man of God that God wants you to be to the next generation. You want to learn these ten truths. Now, ten truths, yes, could be a hundred truths, but those are the ones that we really want to learn. So think about it. You have God, you have the Holy Spirit, you have Solomon, that perfect um, A-team that's going to teach us, and you men along with me, we're going to learn it together. So do not think I'm up here that I have it all together. I'm here as a student who might have found some of this stuff a little bit ahead of you because I got it in front of, front of you on the path. doesn't mean I'm better than you or no more than you. I just got it, and I'm bringing it back to you and say, guys, 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 look at this. This is great stuff. Let's do it. It's for the next generation. It's for the glory of God. We can do this in his word. And I pray that that would be the case. So what are the uh, things that we can learn from Solomon? There are three. One, he got a mandate from God. He got a mandate from God. And what was that mandate? That mandate was to teach his sons. Turn, if you will, now to Deuteronomy chapter 4. It's all listed there, so if you want to go back, you can. But turn to Deuteronomy chapter 4. Some of you have been hearing me say, Fathers, what wise fathers teach their sons. Where did I get that? I got that from the mandate. We'll call it in hermeneutics, the first mentioned principle. Hermeneutics is the proper interpretation of Scripture. What did we learn first? When education was being done in the family, it came from the fathers to the sons. That's the um, gender structure that was going on. We will open up to the wives a little bit later on and the, and the mothers. But right now, I want you to see that the first mention, the weight of the responsibility ultimately re- resides on the husband or we might say head of household. Look at verse 9. It says, um, Moses now speaking, he says, only give heed to yourself. Okay, guys, that's to you as dads. Give heed to yourself. Take care of yourself. Prioritize your life. Get things in order again. God gave you kids. God gave you sons, perhaps. Now you're focused on it. Take heed to yourself. Keep your soul diligently, implying that you might not be able to keep your soul diligently. That it's kind of like mercury. Every time you touch it, it squirts in another direction. So guard your soul. Guard your time. Guard your mind. Guard your life. Be diligent about it because it's easy for you to drift. Then it says, so that you do not forget the things which your eyes have seen, and they do not depart from your heart all the days of your life. Now, what their eyes have seen was the miracles of God as they were going toward the promised land. They saw what God did. Now, you may focus on a miracle and answer to prayer that he's done in your life, but for you right now, they did not have the written word of God. You have the written word of God, and there's a plethora of other miracles that God did that's found in Scripture. So what you want to do is with your eyes what you have seen in his word. And don't let what you've seen in his word depart from your heart all the days of your life. You could say any moment of your life, any time in your life, you own the value of God's word in your life. Then it says, but make them known to your sons and your grandsons. That's what you want to mark. It didn't say granddaughters. It didn't say daughters. I don't believe that it's uh, there to be left out. But I'm going to give you my, um, my understanding of why it's so much on the sons. And you'll see it all through this passage. You'll see it in chapter 4, chapter 6, chapter 9. It's all men with their sons. So here they are, a couple of the reasons. When God is now with a nation, and now he's getting the nation together to do a great work, they've moved them to a place now that the law is going to be given to them. They have the law now. They're going into their land, the promised land. So he's now saying, I've grabbed you from these places. I've taken you out of Egypt. I've given you the word. I'm shoving you into the land right here. You've got to conquer the land, but this is going to be your land. This is your people. So you've got a people and a place and a person, God, in charge of it. I said all that to say this. So... Who is going to lead the country once Moses is gone? 
It's going to be Joshua. Who's going to follow Joshua? Who's going to be head of all the families? They're going to be all masculine leaders of all the tribes, masculine leaders of all the families. So what he's doing is he's saying, what I want to do is I want to give the educational propagation and legacy system. And you start it by having the dads own it, the dads teach the sons, because the sons are going to be the influence of the family when the dads are gone. That's the masculine context that it's in. When you go further into Scripture, you'll often find where it talks about God, Christ, husband, wife, or man, woman. Generally speaking, the influence in society is going to be biblical society now, is the men influencing their wives. That's why scripture says, don't say wife are to be seen and not heard. They do have great influence, great input into the family. It is a shared relationship, but the final decision is made by the dad. In scripture, it talks about the, the brothers, the sons that are to take care of the sisters and the women in the family. So to do that, these men had to own that. Secondly, what the Lord is trying to do now is to preserve a nation. He did say in Scripture that when he's going to preserve this nation, it's going to be to bless all the people groups of the earth. I've taught you that in Romans. We've already been there, done that. All right, so now we're back here. So how do we keep this group together? And he says it's got to come from the masculine. They would be the priests. They would be the warriors. They would be the fathers. They would be the brothers. They would be the sons. They would be the providers. They would be the protectors. They would be the modelers. And the women are now so much receiving from God through this influence in their life that strengthens them in their womanhood, in their wifehood, in their motherhood, in their sisterhood. So we have a healthy society founded upon God's word. Not less, just different, coming to the men. Now, ladies, don't feel like you're left out and that your kids are getting second because there's no man in the house. So you've got to be with us every week because I'll that as well. All right, let's go to verse 10. Remember the day you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb, when the Lord said to me, and now he's repeating what the Lord told Moses, assemble the people to me that I, I may let them hear my words, because there was nothing written at the time, so they may learn to fear me, the Lord, all the days of their life on earth, and that they may teach their children. So he's assembling the people together, getting them ready for a society that's going to be like a school, an educational system going on. Now, that's Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 9 and 10. Go to chapter 6 now. Go to chapter 6. He's still in this sermon, you might say, he's giving. Chapter 6 now. Pick it up, if you will, at verse 4. Here's what it's saying. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. So important. The Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. Jesus picked up on that, and he said that in Matthew as well. That is really the very center. We call that the great commandment, to love the Lord. Then it goes on to say, and love your neighbor, but right now love the Lord with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind. Verse 6, these words which I am commanding you today shall be in your heart. So you are to love the Lord. You're to do all of verse 5. But where are they to be? Those principles of truth are to be in your heart. Dad's first. Remember, diligently you own this, Dad. Verse 7. You shall teach them those words, all of the words that are in your heart, that you believe, you love the Lord, you know the Lord, you know His teachings. You teach them diligently to your sons. And then it tells you how to do that. We've already covered that before. Talk about them. Uh, when you uh, are in the house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you get up in the morning, just every moment you're around your kids in some measure, it's a teachable moment. It goes on to say in verse 8, you'll bind them as a sign on your hand to remind you, to remind them. Frontlets on your forehead, put them on the doorpost. So all around you there's a visible sign that God's word is important and we love the Lord with all of our heart, soul, and mind and how vital that is. Go, if you will, to verse 20. It says, when your son asks you, not the daughter, it's particularly to the son. Not that the daughters can't ask questions, but remember that your son knows this. When they asks you, ask you in time to come, saying, what do the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments, in other words, what does the word of God mean that the Lord commanded you? Well, what does that mean, Dad? I don't understand that. In verse 21, then you shall say to your son, we were slaves, Pharaoh, and Egypt. Like you could say, you know, I remember in Scripture it talked about how as a slave to sin, And the Lord brought me out of this. He delivered it by his power, by me trusting Christ, and I'm born again. Moreover, the Lord has shown great and distressing signs and wonders before our eyes. And you could say, I've learned all of this in God's word. So you're looking back historically to activity, but you by extension see what God is doing today. And look in verse 24. So the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes and then to fear the Lord our God 
for our good always and for our survival as it is today. Now, if you have your Bible, you may want to underline for our good always and for our survival. And so focus. God loves you. His word is good for you. And if you want to really survive in this life and really count for the Lord, it's got to come from his word. So that's the Old Testament. That's very powerful. There's more verses. You can look at them. The sad truth is that if you read the book of Judges, you're going to find that the children of Israel, they heard it. Some of them did it, a couple generations. But then after that, they walked away from it. And they slid so far down that they had to cry unto God, Oh God, we are reprobate. We need you. And there was kind of that change of mind life where they're crying unto the Lord again. And you know what the Lord did? He sent them a deliverer. Now look up here for a second. To me, that's very important because some of you probably been to enough seminars. You've had enough preaching. You've read enough books. Your wife has probably given you enough instruction. Dad's what you need to do. And you have drifted from time to time. And maybe... The Lord is now giving you your come to Jesus moment. And you're finally saying, I've got to really wake up and smell the coffee. My kids are a a year older, 10 years older than when I first did this. I too need to cry unto God. I need to return to the Lord. I need to own him. And when you do, I don't want you to think God is going to say, you had your chance. I'm on to someone else. First of all, that's not his nature. Secondly, he won't do that to you because he loves you. Third, he's not going to do it because he loves your children and your family and he wants that legacy to go on. So today is your day to say, okay, Lord, I do want to come back to you. Children of Israel did. And when they did, every time that they did, when they went back to the Lord, not just with an attitude, with an attitude that had feet and hands, and they followed the word, the Lord then came right back to them. You'll also find it in the New Testament where it talks about that we rear our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. The word nurture and admonition has the word instruction in there, which means that you're to be doing the teaching. So we have a mandate from God, but we also have a model have a model in his father. So Solomon had a model. His dad was one. Now his dad wasn't a perfect dad. He had moral impurity. I believe that uh, one of the root problems that he had was not only moral impurity, but also I believe that David had a problem with deceit. Uh, that'd be some little study for some of you to go through and find out all, how many times that David lied or prevaricated throughout his life as a person, as a leader. It goes on, even as a father. But yet God still used him. But now for you ladies, I'd like you to turn to Second Timothy chapter 1. All the ladies turn there. You men, you can kind of come along for the ride, but all of you ladies... I spent a great deal of time building a case about fathers teaching their sons, and I'm not going to take away from that. I want you to own that. I want you to hear that loudly, but I also want to give you surround sound and technicolor. Because while it began with the importance of the dad through life, wars and other things and dispersions, etc., you're going to find that dads, um, they didn't live as long. Things happen. And so what do you do with the children? If dad's gone, what do you do? Ah, the kid's... Forget that. That's a fractured family. Let's move on to the healthy families that have a mother and father in it. No, the Lord still says, I have a place for you. So ladies, I want you to look at this. This is so cool. Turn, if you will, to 2 Timothy chapter 1. And here's what you read. It says in verse 5, Paul now writing about Timothy, who I believe at this time was fatherless. He says, For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, Timothy, because that's who he's writing to, Timothy. Paul's writing to Timothy. He says, That faith that's in you, which first dwelt in your grandmother, Lois. So you older women here, you other ladies who will eventually become grandmothers, the faith has to be in you first before it'll be in your grandkids. And then it says, And in your mother, Eunice, which means it started in the grandmother, then it went into the mother, and now it's into the son. And I thought this was interesting. You had two women that had an influence upon a boy. I have no doubt that this boy learned a great deal from mother and grandmother. And I have no history that says that he turned out homosexual. Nowhere in scripture. And so we believe that he still was healthy because he had a mother and a grandmother that was full of faith themselves. But don't just stop there. If you will, go to chapter 3 of the same book. Very important now. What did they do? How, how, How did this faith that was in them that now is found in Timothy, who is becoming a pastor of the church at Ephesus, a Christian leader 
who himself had issues with timidity and a few other things, a little shy maybe, a little fearful of people, but still wanting to be strong. How did that happen? Now listen, this is key now. Dads, you listen too. This is important. First, or Second Timothy chapter 3, pick it up now, if you will, at verse 14. He now says, Paul to Timothy, continually writing, he says, you, however, are to do something else. However, what? Verse 12. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, but evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You, however, aren't going to be like them. You, however, do something different. Don't be a deceiver. Don't be an imposter. Don't be an evil man. You, however, continue in the things, this is important, you learn and been convinced of. So in other words, Timothy knew something, that's the learning, being convinced of that he had conviction of it, not only something he knew as information, but it was truth for his life. You've learned and you have now a conviction. Then it says, knowing from whom you have learned them. You could circle the word whom in the Greek. It's not a one person whom, it's a plural whom. Knowing from whom you have learned them. So this would be the sum total of those that were people of the faith that now built into Timothy's life. And so since we've already studied in chapter 2 here that it was the grandmother and the mother, they would be the primary influencers of Timothy because that's who he learned these truths from. You could salt and pepper in there Paul and a few others, but primarily it came from the filial family of the grandmother and the mother, from whom you learn these truths. You learn them, you're convinced of them. Now verse 15, this is the key. And that from childhood you have known the sacred scriptures, the sacred writings. Well, who do you think taught Timothy? It would be the grandmother and the mother, even while the little boy was a child learning the sacred writings. I don't believe he was saved at the time. He was getting this from perhaps an unsaved grandmother, an unsaved mother, but in some measure they had some knowledge of God's word and they're feeding him that truth. That goes a little bit further. Which are able to give you wisdom. What's able to give you wisdom? The sacred writing of God's word. So look up here for just a moment, if you will. I do not want to put down seminars and books and CDs and DVDs and all the things you might go to that will help you to be a good parent. As long as whatever you're getting out there of that great information, that that information is there, but the Bible is on top of that so that what you're learning about parenting is coming from God's word. That's the key. So that when you're teaching your child the scriptures, it's when they're embracing scripture that they know it is God's mind on paper, it's accurate, etc., it's veracity, all of its truth. Then from that, they're able to know God and they're able to know salvation. So you're teaching them God's words. All the stuff you might give them, all the neat little books that are out there, all the little gimmicky stuff that they have for little children that you can get at a Bible bookstore, all that may be good. But remember, plunge into the word of God. And to teach them the word of God, the sacred writings, as much as you can, as much as they could understand. Ask God for the ability to take God's word and put it at the level of the thinking and the mindset of your child and where he or she is at. goes on. Let's go on. It says, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ. So what gave him that strong faith? Women in his life that then taught him. God's word. So again, the mandate is from God. The model is from the Father. We know that Timothy was also taught by Paul. So it all goes together. Well, we're out of time, folks. Thank you for giving me your time for today. If you come back next week, what I want to answer before I get into my other lessons will be the question, did Solomon really get the message from his father? And then secondly... What happens when a kid listens to his mom and dad? So that's what I'm going to answer next week. Let's pray, shall we? With every head bowed and every eye closed. I'm looking forward to next week because next week we're going to build on the concept of wisdom. And I want to give you the very first lesson that's found in chapter 1, that that's the foundational lesson, that if they have that lesson, the other nine lessons will be easier for your child to learn and will be easier for him to apply because he has the first lesson down pat. So you want to be here next week to learn what is the first lesson that I need to inculcate into my child's thinking so that he would learn it and have that conviction. 
And I want to build my nurturing, my atmosphere, the environment for that child to own lesson number one so that the rest of the lessons will be a lot easier. If they don't have lesson one, the others will be kind of nice, but they may not be so sustainable if they don't have the foundation right. And that's going to be next week. I want you to be a part of that. But now for the rest of you that are here that are on a particular journey with the Lord and you're saying, I, I need God in my own life. I know I've got to get into my kid's life, but I need it in my own life. Do you know that the Lord loves you, that you were in his mind before you were ever born? Do you know that he's already provided the way of salvation for you before you ever um, understood that? That it's not a new thing? And that Jesus Christ loved you so much that he went to the cross and he died and he rose again? Now, that may be a horrible phrase to think about God, man, dying on a cross. What's a cross? What did it look like? How did he die? Why did he die? This resurrection is so bizarre. But it's really not. It's been proven to be true. People saw Jesus when he was alive. They saw him when he was dead, 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 dead. They also saw him when he came back to life again after the resurrection. They even heard his voice. Jesus even allowed them to come and touch him. So he was real. The resurrection really happened. And he did all of that in obedience to God the Father. He did all of that to satisfy the payment for sin for you. And now he offers to you freely the gift of eternal life. And all you have to do is to place your faith alone in him. So your first cry might be not, Lord, make me a good dad or a good um, teacher, mentor in my family to my kids and grandkids. Your first one will be, Lord, I need you first. I need you to be in my heart, in my mind, in my life. So right now I'm trusting you that you died and you rose again. And so I'm not going to walk by sight or by feeling But I'm going to take you at your word when you said that he that believes on you has everlasting life. So my faith is in you and your word that you now will forgive me of my sin. And by the way, dear ones, when you do that, you are saved once and for all. And you have the Holy Spirit just like that. You now have the capacity to learn the word. You have the capacity now to live the word. You have the capacity now to teach the word to your kids. It all comes when you walk through the door of Jesus Christ by trusting in him. So that's where it begins. And now you have him And you have something great going for you. My object is not to have your kid be a preacher or a missionary. The object of all of the teaching of God is to have him to be like Christ. To be like God. And whatever he's called to be, a butcher, baker, candlestick maker, that he would be full on for God, living in a way that would be pleasing to him. If today you're trusting Christ as your Savior and you're calling upon him to be your Savior forever, I'd like to know about that. So I'm going to ask you to slip up your hand in a moment. Now, raising your hand won't make you come forward, won't have to fill out a card, won't do anything to embarrass you, but I'd like to pray for you. I do this every week because we never know when there's an unsaved person, and there are Christians that care so much for you, and they've never shook your hand or even talked to you today, but they want you to know Christ, and they're praying for you. They're thrilled that I'm doing this right now because they know that this may be the only time you're going to hear the gospel in your life. may not be. God knows those who will be saved. But today is your day to hear it. Perhaps today is the day you're going to trust Him. If you're trusting Christ as your Savior, with every head bowed and every eye closed, no one looking around, and you'd like for me to remember you in prayer, would you very quickly just put your hand up, put it down, and when I pray for you, I'll welcome you into God's family. I don't don't make you get saved. I don't... You know, join in the church. I just know that you're trusting Christ and I'm going to pray for you. So put your hand up real high right now. I'm going to do it just for a second. Now put it up. Today's the day you're trusting Christ. Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come as people of God, your children, the sheep of your pasture. And we thank you that you have given us our own children. You've given us other people's children. And you've placed us in a faith family with that there are children all around us that we can influence So, Lord, help all of us together realize that the whole idea of propagating the faith, propagating the true God of Scripture, lies upon us in the next generation that we would all be involved in rearing up the next generation leaders and influencers. So, Father, I pray that as this was given to Solomon from David and from Moses through the line down to David that it all started with you. And it didn't stop with Solomon. It didn't stop with his sons. 
but it is now in our lap for our day and times such as these. So, Father, thank you for your word and your spirit as you're now going to help us to be all the dads, moms, and grandparents we should be for our kids. In Jesus' name, amen. You're listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando, Florida. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It is the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. Or you can mail your gift to Make It Clear, P.O. Box 607-901, Orlando, Florida, 32860. Thank you for helping us make it clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please send us an email at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear.